The RTX 2000 series has brought many a conflict, feelings between that of ups and downs, Though this card right here, the Asus Strix ROG 2080 Ti is definitely one of the uppers when it comes to this line of Turing graphics cards. Booting straight into the details, overclocks. This thing was a solid overclocker, gaining about 140 MHz on the core and memory close to that of 200 MHz. This enabled, as I'll put up on the graph here, a max core clock of 1965 MHz out of the box, and when overclocked, it hit an absolute mind-boggling 2115 MHz on the core. And the best thing was it still managed to do so whilst remaining relatively quiet. Though, more on that later. This enabled this card right here to pull anywhere from 30 to 50% ahead in the benchmarks as we'll see later when compared to that of the custom Gigabyte RTX 2080 overclock we have here and also the GTX 1080 Ti OC that is also here in the Tech Yes studio. So strap on in ladies and gentlemen because this one is about to get hot, pretty and downright ugly. That weird analogy, of course, relates to the inner struggle between you and your wallet because make no doubt about it, the 2080 Ti is an expensive car. The Asus 2080 Ti ROG Strix weighs in at about 1.47 kilograms, is triple slot in my eyes, though Asus officially call it 2.7 times. It has RGB LED lighting on the rear, sides, and underneath of the card that is controllable via software and can connect to Aura Sync on your motherboard and other components. There are three 80mm axial fans that feature an all-round better design than previous models that are IP5X dust resistant too, something I'll test in due time with the DataVac of course. Asus are also implementing Auto Extreme technology which has to do with soldering of the components on the card itself. It's automated and it's all done in one pass hinting to the fact that it will be more reliable product which will go the longer distance. It also, in my opinion, has one of the best aesthetics of any graphics card to date, though, of course, how does it perform at both 1440p ultrawide and 4K, might you ask? Well, pulling up the first graph here for you guys, Far Cry 5 1440p, showing that there's a small boost at this ultra-wide setting. At this stage, it was only taking the lead here by roughly 20%, but 4K results were soon to show that this was more of a CPU limitation at 1440p ultra-wide, and honestly, a CPU limitation on a demanding title like Far Cry 5 on maximum settings at 21 by 9 1440p is no small feat, might I add. I'm running these tests on a 7820X at 4.5 gigahertz too, and DDR4 memory is running at 3200 megahertz. Moving on with Scum. The results showed anywhere near a 30 to 35% gain at 1440p ultra wide, and then moving on to 4K showed a similar trend continuing, though PUBG was soon to show what the ROG RTX 2080 Ti was really capable of, gaining roughly a 40 to 50% boost over the other cards here. I honestly had to go back and double check these numbers to make sure, but sure enough, 1440p and 4K showed some massive gains allowing the overclocks on this graphics card itself to flex over even its default clocks. Moving on with Destiny, just a PG-friendly benchmark of me playing some soccer at the farm, and 1440p showed an average frame rate, pulling ahead by, again, roughly 45-51% to 51 compared to the 1080Ti. 4K continued a similar trend, managed to cap an impressive 52% overclocked versus overclocked, though I could have received a golden sample here, or maybe that's just Zeus's claims of implementing the best style of air cooler in the biz are showing some truth. Though it was pretty eye-opening to see how aggressive the results were when looking at the overclocked numbers. Though looking at our simulated 2880p World of Warcraft benchmark, this is over double the pixels of 4K by the way. Things came back down a bit here to reality, and our simulated results only showed a 24-27% to 27 increase over the 1080 Ti and the RTX 2080. Then around a 30% difference overclocked versus overclocked. Next up we had the infamous Crisis 3 and that question that didn't get answered in the RTX 2080 review, if you haven't seen it I'll put it up here, was can it run Crisis at 4K? And we were honestly so close to that magical 4K 60fps number, it was disheartening. It got almost there, 58 FPS when it was overclocked, and we're using very high settings, which is pretty much the max settings you can use, with two times MSAA. And here it's scored overclocked versus overclocked, around about a 38 to 49% lead over the other two top dogs in the race, and non-OC, 30 and 40% over the 2080 and 1080Ti respectively. Though 1440p was roughly the same as 4K, so the CPU limitations were not present in either benchmarks. 
The Final Fantasy XV benchmark, they do say it does have DLSS enabled. This netted some massive gains for the 2080 Ti, not just over that of the 1080 Ti, interestingly enough, but also its little brother, the 2080. It was nearly a 33 and 36% gain, overclocked versus overclocked versus the boys, and non-OC saw a 27 and 30% increase respectively. And moving on with some other simulated benchmarks, and these are pretty important because unfortunately I don't have any other 2080 Ti cards here, to compare the ROG card to. So it's going to give you, the viewer, a rough estimate of how well this card can perform at both stock and at overclock settings. And the overclock settings indeed show nearly a 10% boost in performance over the stock settings, which is massive, especially on a flagship card, but it also showed how well the card could pull ahead of both itself and the 1080 Ti scoring about 48% more points and roughly 40% more than the RTX 2080 from Gigabyte. Though Fire Strike showed a mere 23% increase over the 1080 Ti and roughly 30% over the RTX 2080. Guess it needs more magical eye candy for it really to pull ahead. Of course, at this stage, it is important to mention that I'm still yet to come into any real world applications that utilize tensor cores and ray tracing. The Star Reflection demo is capped at 24 FPS, and it's just not really a good benchmark to get any really solid indicator of performance with these graphics cards, especially since there's no gameplay involved in it. Though, back to the Strix itself. Power consumption was quite big, both stock and overclocked, coming in well ahead of that of both the 2080 and 1080 Ti. Stock total system power consumption is up nearly 31% compared to that of the 2080 and 15% compared to the 1080 Ti. Overclocking sees the consumption balloon out to 47% and 30% respectively. Of course, with a lot more CUDA cores of 4,352 than both the 2080's 2,944 and 1080 Ti's 3,584, it is bound to use a bit more power. It also features the faster GDDR6 memory, same as the 2080, and has 11 gigabytes of it versus eight gigabytes on the 2080 and 11 gigabytes of GDDR5X on the 1080 Ti. It also, just like the 1080 Ti, features a mind-boggling 352-bit wide memory bus bigger than that of the 2080's 256-bit. Though fan speeds and noise, this is where ASUS's implementation of their cooler proved that the 2080 Ti ROG Strix showed that it could easily keep the heat under control, and the sweet spot here was 60% fan speeds in my opinion. Though people who hate noise will be glad to see that I actually had to physically stop the CPU cooling fans to get an accurate reading of 39 dB when it was on auto. So yes, the temperatures went up to 75 degrees on auto, but the noise was ridiculously low for a flagship card and the fans only spun up to 35%. I mean, it could just be that this Strix here is indeed the best Strix of them all. The max core clocks, as we mentioned before, showed that this card pulled well ahead in the overclocking department. So it seems ASUS's claims to having the best implementation of a cooler are coming to fruition beating that of Gigabyte's lower power consuming 2080 by roughly 5%. Lastly, finishing off on the features, the card features a three year warranty, has an additional button to turn RGB LED lighting off instantly. And when this card is set to auto, that's the out of the box settings, it has a silent fan feature. When the idle on the desktop, the fans will just simply stop spinning. It also has a fatter PCB at 11 and centimeters, at least compared to the standard design of the RTX 2080 we have here. It also has two 8-pin connectors, USB Type-C at the back, and two display ports, and two HDMI 2.0 outs. Which I do prefer, as a lot of people I build PCs for do tell me they like having a HDMI for their basic monitor and one for VR, so it fits the bill nicely. It also has a clean backplate with the ROG iRGB shining through, and finally there is a brace going through the side of the card to help prevent GPU sag. Quite a nice idea, since the card is very heavy and bulky. So when it all comes down to it, this card right here is a beast. Out of all the graphics cards I've tried in the past, I like this thing the most. Only ever so slightly over the Hall of Fame design, however, I did really like that too. But I'm honestly not liking the price tag. It is very expensive for a gaming graphics card, make no mistake. I actually don't know the official MSRP in Australia, but going by previous years of ROG Strix cards, it will most likely command a slight premium over the reference MSRP. At the moment, NVIDIA's 1199 USD Founders card, or in Oz 1899, is two slot, has a massive amount of unnecessary metal on it that doesn't help to cool the card, and doesn't look anywhere near as good as this card right here, in my opinion. So if it's anything to go by, the premium is going to be easily worth it, for basically a card that has had everything 
beefed up on it from the PCB to the VRM to the cooler, which will enable you to overclock to higher levels of performance or have extremely low levels of noise, which on a flagship is, dare I say, highly desirable. Yes, it's expensive and no, you're not going to get the best frames per dollar, but I can't help but actually like the 2080 Ti a lot more than the 2080, especially as it actually gives us something new and that is higher performance over the existing flagship. But if you are in the market for this card, then you're going to know that you either want it or you don't. And if you are that person who wants a 2080 Ti and you want the best of the best, then this is certainly going to deliver that. And if premium is what you are prepared to pay, then this thing will definitely give you a premium experience. Anyway guys, hope you enjoyed today's review. If you did, then be sure to overclock that like button. Let me know in the description below. Have you ever used a Republic of Gamers card? If so, what was your experience like with it? If not, do you want one? Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always, and I'll catch you in the next tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye. Just buy it.